Tertullus said, for we have found this man, Paul, a plague. Oh my God. It says that, Tertullus said that they have found this man, Paul, a plague. You know, when, when you become a believer, that's where they're gonna find you. You know, if you're really walking in the ways of God, many people in this world are gonna find you a plague. They're gonna find you like COVID-19. <laughs> That's, that's, that's what the Jews thought of Paul, that he's like COVID-19 to them. Just the word and none of that hate gon' work. Hey, hey. Hold on, hold on. Now I don't know what you heard. But don't believe anyone that can't show you the word. Okay, we're up to Acts 24. Really, Acts 22, 23, and 24 happened within a span of 12 days. <laughs> and, and... In order to understand Acts, what's going to happen in Acts 24, you, you should have been here in Acts 22 and Acts 23. Let me try to encapsulate it. Paul went to the temple to, to do an offering because he took a vow. He's there for the day of Pentecost. And then some Jews that were from Asia noticed him. And then they said a lie that he, he's profaning the temple, that he brought in some Gentiles in the, into the temple, which is uh, against the law of Moses. So then they started beating him up and then the, the, the soldiers came and pulled him out to rescue him because he was getting beat up and they were about to whip him to see what, what's going on. We're going to get some more information of why they're going crazy with this guy. But then Paul say, wait a minute, I'm a Roman citizen. You can't just whip me. And then when the, when one of the commanders heard it, heard of that, he was like, whoa, we can't do that. So they put him in jail. And then the next day they had the leaders, the Jewish leaders with Paul to see what's going on. And then the high priest had somebody smack Paul in the face. And then, um, you know, then they started arguing back and forth because Paul brought up the resurrection. Paul was perceptive and he said that he believed in the resurrection. So then he caused a division between the Pharisees and Sadducees. So then chaos again erupted. So they pulled out Paul. And then there was going to be a, a assassination attempt on Paul. But when it was found out, the commander sent 470 soldiers with Paul to go to Caesarea, which is north of Jerusalem, so they could, um, you know, protect him. And then he could have this case brought up against him in front of the governor now. So it went from, you know, people, a mob mentality to to the high priest and one of the commanders, the Roman commanders, to now it's going up. It's like, think of it like in America where there's like a, a circuit court and then there's, there's a small claims court, then a circuit court, then a Supreme Court. Right now he's like in the circuit court. So now, and he's being brought before Felix to see what's going on because they still, I, it's been five, it's been seven days and they still don't know why Paul is arrested. You know, they, they want Paul killed, but they don't have a reason. So with that, we'll start in um, Acts 24, verse one. And after five days, the high priest Aeneas came down with some elders and, and a spokesman, one to tell us they laid before the governor their case against Paul. Okay, so now... Now the high priest, the one that has Paul smacked, and actually the one that had Jesus smacked, this is the same guy that tell, tells people to smack people around. He's, he's now got a, a spokesman. So he got somebody that's more polished to present their case before governor. Cause you know, they, it's like going to court, you know, you ever see like criminals try to defend themselves in, in a, in, in, in like a criminal case. It, it looks bad. You want somebody when you're in, in a courtroom setting to, to present you. And that's what they did. So they had this guy named Tertullus represent the, the Jews that are against Paul. Next verse. And, and when they had summoned, when, and when he had been summoned, Tertullus began to accuse Paul saying, now this is what he's going to say before the, the governor, Felix. Since through you, Felix, we enjoy much peace. And since by your foresight, most excellent Felix, reforms are being made for this nation. So, so Tertullus starts off with praising the governor, which is a wise move to do. Paul's going to do it later on in, in this chapter. But when you go before an, an elected official, try to, you know, show decorum. 
Now try to be respectful. And that's and this is what this guy Tertullus is doing. And that is why the Jews chose him because they were like, you know, we need somebody that's polished to present our case. And that's what he's doing. He's presenting, he's trying to heap praise on the governor. So, you know, it might soften his, the, his, the, his mind to his position. Verse three, in every way and everywhere, we accept this with all gratitude. You know, the, the reforms that are being made. Next verse. But to detain you no further, I beg you, governor, in your kindness to hear us briefly. So he, you know, again, he's trying to present his case to the point and, you know, he's trying to show respect to the governor saying, look, I, we don't want to bother you. We just want to show you what the issue is. Verse five, for we have found this man. So he said, Tertullus said, for we have found this man, Paul, a plague. Oh my God. Yeah, it says that. Tertullus said that they have found this man, Paul, a plague. You know, when, when you become a believer, that's where they're going to find you. You know, if you're really walking in the ways of God, many people in this world are going to find you a plague. They're going to find you like COVID-19. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what the Jews thought of Paul, that he's like COVID-19 to them. One who stirs up riots among all the Jews throughout the world. <laughs> Wow, you talk about projecting, because fact, truth be told is, Paul's not starting the riots. Paul is just preaching that Jesus rose from the dead. It's the unbelieving Jews that, that are causing the riots. But here, he's saying that it's Paul that's stirring up riots and is a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. Okay, so he said that he's a ringleader. He's a, one of the, the main guys of a sect. That word sect is like a heresy. Ringleader of the her her heretics of the Nazarenes. Now, why why did Tertullus call him a Nazarene? Why did he call them the um, disciples or people of the way or Christians? Because that word Nazarene was like a slander. Remember, um, Philip in John one said, "Can anything good come out of Nazareth?" So it, he's saying that they, these guys are uh, belong to a sect of these Nazarenes. You know, it, you know, they, it's like an insult to, to the way. Verse six, he even, now he, he so Charlie's talking about Paul, about Paul. So he said this, he, Paul even tried to profane the temple. So he, he's accusing of Paul trying to do something wrong in the temple. You know, profane means like you go into, let's just say you went into a church and you're uh, putting graffiti on the wall. <laughs> that, that's what he's accusing Paul of. He even tried to profane the temple, but we seized them and we would have judged them according to our law. Okay. So they're like, you know, we, you know, we, we can handle this. We don't, we don't need you. Um, Roman governor, we can handle this guy. But the thing is, Paul's a Roman citizen, so they can't just handle him according to their law. They still got to respect the law of Rome, which is higher than them at this time. Verse seven, but the chief captain Lysias came and with great violence took him away out of our hands you know because lizzie was like you know he saw the mob beating up paul he didn't know what's going on so he decided to take out paul you know by the goodness of god he took out paul yeah because you know they were beating him up verse verse eight command now lizzie commanded his accusers the, the jews to come before you by examining them yourself you will be able to find out from him about everything of which we accuse him. So they were like, they, the commanding, you know, Lysias took him out and now they brought him before the governor, Felix. And they, but this is weird. He said that you yourself will be able to find out from him about everything which we accuse him of. So that, you know, they want him to do what, what's called in America, um, you know, to criminalize himself. You know, not, not to plead the fifth <laughs> that Paul will basically tell you what, the, what they're accusing him of. Yeah. What's it called again? Self-incriminate. Yeah. It's self-incriminate. That's the word I'm looking for. That's what they believe that Paul's going to do. Verse nine, the Jews also join in the charge. So the Jews that were with Tertullus said, yes, you know, what he's saying is true. Affirming that all these things were so verse 10. And when the governor had nodded to, to him to speak, Paul replied. Now, Paul is speaking now, defending himself. 
Knowing that for many years you have been a judge over this nation, I cheerfully make my defense. See, again, notice Paul knew where he was at and he knew that he should be respectful to the governor. And he's, uh, he said, I cheerfully make my defense because you have been a judge for many years. So he's, he's trying to show him, look, you, you've been here for a long time. You, you're a competent judge. So I'm glad I'm before you. See, that's wisdom. So, you know, but in a court setting, be wise. Don't be like, no, man, he's lying. No, try to, you know, sh present your case with respect and with um, decorum. Verse 11, you can verify that it is not more than 12 days since I went up to worship in Jerusalem. So again, Paul went there to worship on the day of Pentecost. Verse 12. And they did not find me disputing with anyone or stirring up a crowd, either in the temple or in the synagogue or in the city. You know, so Paul went throughout Jerusalem. He, he wasn't doing nothing. He was just walking around, you know, just <coughs> worshiping or just doing daily tasks. He wasn't saying, let's revolt against Rome or Let, let's cause um, chaos in the temple. No, he was just be, doing what everybody else was doing. Verse 13. Neither can they prove to you what they are now bringing up against me. They can't. You know, what, how, what proof do they have that Paul was causing a riot or stirring up um, dissension? What, what proof? They have none. They're just making it out of thin air. They're the ones doing it. And, and truth be told, verse 14. But this I confess to you, that according to the way, remember, the, the believers never called their faith Christianity or, um, you know, they called their faith the way. But I confess to, you, confess to you that according to the way, which they call a heresy. So the Jews called what Paul believed a heresy. And this is something that we should learn that when you're really walking in the ways of God, there's going to be people that are going to accuse you of being a heretic. They're going to say, oh, what you believe is heresy. You know, then you say, okay, show me book, chapter, verse where I'm a heretic. They don't, they just use their um, regurgitated verses to defend their doctrine. But don't be surprised if people call you a heretic. And guess what? They call Paul a heretic, which they call a heresy. I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law and written the prophets. So he's saying, look, I'm just following the Bible. I just believe what the Bible says. That's what he's basically saying. Verse 15. Having a hope in, in God, which these men themselves accept, that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. So he's saying, look, I believe what they believe. They believe in the re resurrection. I believe in the resurrection. So why, why are they um, accusing me and trying to get me in trouble? And you know, it, it also says that these um, leaders were also Pharisees because the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. Verse 16. This being, Paul still speaking, this being so, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense toward God and man. So he's saying, because of, because of this belief, I always strive to have a conscience without offense toward God and man. You know, we, and, and, and like I said, we should apply this to our lives. We should live with, with a mindset of, if I'm offending God or I'm offending people, show it to me, God. So I will, I will be like God, uh, uh, be, I will be like Paul and say, I always strive to have a conscience without, without offense toward God and man. So if you ever have an issue with somebody, try to resolve it because Paul always strived to have a conscience without offense. That should be our mentality as believers that we should walk with. I don't want to offend God. God, if I'm doing something that you, is displeasing to you, show it to me. Show it to me in the word. Convict me, Holy Spirit. And towards man, if, if I offended somebody, you know, even if you don't even know you offended them, try to resolve it. Go up to say, you know, is everything okay? How did I offend you and all that? Always strive like Paul. Verse 17. Now, this is very important. Look at what Paul said here. Now, after several years, I came to bring alms to my nation and to present offerings. Paul said, after several years, I came to bring alms to my nation and to present offering. Now, this, this verse shows that Paul was not keeping 
the law of Moses perfectly. Because we read in Deuteronomy, I got it right here, Deuteronomy 16, 16. It says this, three times a year, all your men must appear before the Lord your God. Wait a minute. Paul said, after several years, I came to bring alms to my nation. But here, the law says you're supposed to appear three times a year. It says, let me keep reading. In Deuteronomy 16, 16, three times a year, all your men must appear before Lord your God at the place where he will choose, which was Jerusalem. At the, and these are the three times they must appear. At the Feast of Unleavened Bread, that's during the Passover. At the Feast of Weeks, which Paul is at, at this time. And at the festival of ta Feast of Tabernacles. No one should appear before the Lord empty-handed. So Paul, not only did he not go, be and because he didn't go, he went empty-handed all those years. But now, after seven years, I came to bring alms to my nation and to present offerings. So it shows that once he became a follower of Christ, if you remember last week, remember what Jesus told him in a vision? After he, um, he believed and got baptized by Aeneas, he told them that I'm going to send you far away into the Gentiles. He said to get out of Jerusalem. So Jesus commanded Paul not to go back to Jerusalem because they wanted to kill him. But now Paul finally came back after several years. So we see that at least with, in Paul's case, he didn't keep the law perfectly because um, he's supposed to be there at least three times a year. And if he wasn't there for three years, that means for, for nine times he didn't go. So... Anyway, let's keep going. Verse 18. While I was doing this, they found me purified in the temple without any crowd or tumult. So he was in the temple. Remember, there was a four men with him and they made an offering. He, they shaved their heads. They were purifying themselves. But look, but some Jews from Asia, remember, the Jews from Asia are the ones that really have a problem with Paul. Because Paul's doing a lot of um, work in, in Asia and having a great impact. And they knew who Paul was. But some Jews from Asia, they ought to be here. So really, Paul's saying, look, these guys, these um, um, Pharisees and, and, and religious leaders, they don't know what's going on. These guys know because they're the ones that made the accusation anyway. They ought to be here before you and to make an accusation should they have anything against me. So in other words, they, they, they know me. And yet if they do come here, they got nothing, they got nothing to accuse me of. I did nothing wrong because you know, they're the ones really bringing up the charges. Verse 20, or else let these men themselves say what wrongdoing they found when I stood before the council. So he's saying, okay, forget those Jews in Asia. All right, the high priest and all these religious leaders, tell me what I did wrong. T tell me exactly, not your emotions, not what you believe or you're distorting. You tell me, verse 21, other than this one thing that I cried out while standing among them. So this is Paul in his mind. He's saying, this is the real reason that they want me killed. It is with respect to the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you this day. So Paul is saying, look, the reason, the real reason, you know, let, let's, let's get over these games of, of um, saying that I profaned the temple or I brought Gentiles in. That's not the real issue. The real issue, the reason why they want to kill me is it is with respect to the resurrection of the dead that I am in trial before you this day. He's saying because I believe Jesus Christ rose from, rose from the dead. This is why they're trying to kill me. So, you know, he, he just, he just went to the, the issue at hand, you know, he's being real. The other guys are being fakes. They're trying to, you know, lay up false charges. He's saying, look, this is why this is the real reason they want to kill me. Verse 22, but Felix, the governor having a rather accurate knowledge of the way. So he, Felix knew about what we call, you know, Christianity. He knew about what Paul believed. He was not ignorant. But, but Felix, having a, a rather accurate knowledge of the way, put them off, put the, 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 the Jews that are against Paul off, saying, when Lysias the Tribune comes down, I will decide your case. So Lysias, remember, he's the, the commander, the one that pulled out Paul from, from getting beat, and, and, and he heard the case last week, you know, well, five days ago in, in, in this story. So he's saying when he comes, because he's like a third witness, you know, we got the 
the unbelieving Jews version. We got Paul's version, but Lysias was there. So he knows a lot. So he's saying, look, Lysias not here. When he comes, I'll get his version and then I'll make a decision. All right. Verse 23. Then he gave orders to the centurion that he should, that Paul should be kept in custody, but have some liberty. So in other words, he said, okay, Paul st still has to be in jail, but I'll give him some liberty. You know, he, he, and this is the liberty he gave him and that none of his friends should be prevented from attending his needs. So he said, look, yeah, Paul, he's in jail, but I I'll give him some liberty. You know, there's other people in jail. They got no liberty. They're like in isolation, but I let him, I let him have his friends indicating that Felix knew this is a bunch of nonsense that the Jews were throwing at Paul, but you know, he, well, we're going to keep reading. We'll see why he just didn't let Paul go. Verse 24. After some days, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, and he sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. So Felix said, you know, let me get more. I know a little bit about the way, but bring up Paul because he's one of the ringleaders. Let me, let me hear about this faith in Jesus. So Paul is presenting the gospel to Felix and his wife, Drusilla, verse 25. And as he, Paul, reasoned about righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment. Notice what Paul talked to Felix about. He talked about, well, he first talked about the faith in Christ Jesus, but he also talked about righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment. You know, if your presentation of the gospel does not talk about righteousness, you're always talking about the grace of God, the love of God, and how God's going to get you over this mountain. If it doesn't talk about self-control, meaning you, you got to get, you, there's urges in you that you need to repent of and you need to control. And you don't talk about the coming judgment when God's going to judge the living and the dead. And those that don't believe they're going to be first put into captivity and then they're going to be thrown into the lake of fire. If you don't talk about those things, you're not preaching what Paul preached. Because this is what he reasoned with Felix about. Now, what was Felix's reaction? Felix was alarmed. So he's like, whoa, you know, and that's, that's godly fear. You know, and unfortunately, a lot of preaching out there, they don't preach the godly fear. But Paul did. Paul did to Felix and his wife. Felix was alarmed and said, go away for the present. So he's like, okay, look, you're, you're, you're scaring me a little bit. So go away for the present. When I have, when I get an opportunity, I will summon you. So he cut him short. He's like, oh, okay. Now, now you're, you're creeping me out. You're, you're, you know, you're getting me concerned. And so I'll summon you when I want to see you again. Verse 26. Now this is why he kept summoning him. At the same time, he hoped that money would be given him by Paul. So he was like hoping that Paul would give him some cash to get out. In other words, like to commit a bribe. He wanted a bribe from Paul, but Paul never gave in. You know, we as believers do not give in to bribes. You know, if you're going to suffer for Christ, don't let people do it. Because guess what? If they bribe you once, they're going to do it again. Paul, he was expecting that Paul and his friends would give him some um, bailout money so he could bail him out. But, but the, him, Paul and his um, followers did not do that. So he sent for him often and conversed with him. So he always had Paul come and talk, and which is a good thing. Felix was very open, very receptive to Paul. Verse 27. When two years had elapsed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus. And desiring to do, do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. So we went from three chapters, you know, three chapters took 12, 12 days. Now for two years, Paul's locked up, you know, and why to do the Jews a favor, not because he did anything wrong, but because he, he didn't want the Jews to go crazy. He left Paul in prison. And what does that teach us? One that in this world, there might not be justice in this world. If you're, if you're really banking on justice in the world, then there's going to be a possibility that you might not get justice. You might get injustice. You know, it reminds me of, um, the, the January 6th, um, people that went into the Capitol. 
They trespassed. They did something wrong. They did something illegal. But most people that trespass usually get like a week, a month. Yeah, we have people that are going to be sentenced for two years. There's people in isolation. So there's in, in some cases, sometimes injustice will occur because there's a political reasoning. You know, I remember I, I remember I heard this week about a case in, in Georgia about uh, Arm, Armory, uh, Arbury, uh, Ahmad, Arm, Arbury, that's his name. You know, there were three people that got life sentences. Two of them were the ones chasing them with guns, and that's reasonable. But the third guy, all he was doing was recording, trying to document what was happening. He got life. Okay, I can understand you him getting five months, maybe five years for, for his part, quote unquote participation. But in it, his intent was just to document it. He got life sentence. Why? Because it's a politically motivated trial. So we got to be aware. Sometimes, even as a believer, we might be arrested and, then not, and you might get a sentence that's not fair. Paul got two years in jail because Felix wanted to, Jew, wanted to do the Jews a favor and he left them there. You know, I wouldn't say rotting because at least he had some liberty, but this was unjust. But also, I, I, was, I, I remember the words of Jesus that Jesus told Paul that I will show him when, when Paul became a believer. He told Paul that I will show him the things he will suffer for my name's sake. So just as Paul had people in prison, you know, this is God letting him get, get a little taste of what he did. You know, one thing I, I, when you study the Bible, God will forgive you of your sins, but there's consequences to your sins. God's still, God's still a just God that he will still punish your sins on earth. You know, I remember David, you know, when he slept with Bathsheba and murdered her husband, that prophet Nathan said, yes, your sins are forgiven, but because of what you did, someone is going to rise up in your kingdom and, and what you did secretly is going to be done openly. There's consequences. So, you know, that should put up, a, give us a little godly fear that we should live right. Cause, but I'm, I, but the thing is, even with Paul, I'm pretty sure while he's in prison, it was a blessing for him. It wasn't like, he was like, Oh, please get me out. He was getting drawing closer to the Lord. You know, the, the saints saw him suffering. So he's like, wow, he's suffering and enduring. I, I could do it. So even this, God used this for a blessing for Paul and for other believers. But again, he's now he's in jail for two years, you know, because the governor didn't want to make the Jews go crazy, a political decision. All right. And that's where we'll end um, for today. Next week, he, now he's going to go to the, the new governor. Um, Portius Festus. So he's going to have this trial redone again two years later. So we'll end there. So, um, all right.